The first challenge was actually the day that we opened, uh, but we have less pressure in one respect because we have the credit lines. The flip side to that is we're answerable also to other people so that there's more pressure. It's even more challenging when you're talking about a very specific seasonal product where you have a limited time frame to clear that product. Literally, overnight we had to change about the whole business model. It was horrible, I have to say. It was, it was incredibly stressful. But back in COVID, we, it was literally, it was like going to the corner shop in Coronation Street. <laughs> this week's guests are Marshall Fries and Simon Williams, who, for only three weeks each year, run a pop-up shop. Hear why they do it, the unique challenges they face, how COVID turned everything on its head, and what the key is to its continued year-on-year -year improvement. Before we start, I have one simple request of you. Please hit the follow or subscribe button on the app that you're listening on. That's it. Thank you. If you're in retail or indeed any business, you'll find this week's episode fascinating. Okay, something very different on this week's uh, Leeds Business Podcast. We have Marshall and Simon from the Passover Pop-Up Shop. Hi, Marshall. Hi, Simon. Hi, Phil. How are you doing? Hi, Phil. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So, for all our listeners, give us a very brief intro, intro into the Pop-Up Shop and what it is. So, the Pop-Up Shop is um, a retail outlet that was set up um seven well six years ago actually um we set it up when a local shop closed very abruptly uh where people could go and purchase their passover products and uh, there was nowhere else for them to go and marshall and i decided to uh, take on the mantle of setting up a retail outlet in two weeks basically that sounds like a great idea let's let's set up a pop-up shop in in two weeks time it, it was one of those ideas where you think actually we, we're going to do this and and before we knew it we were so far down the line we had to do it um and yeah like simon said we're now seventh our seventh year um and uh it's become part of the calendar it's a fixture within the within the community calendar okay okay before we go on um just give our listeners a brief introduction to yourselves and your background so marshall first uh, i'm marshall freeze i uh, i'm based in leeds i run a business called the one solution um i've been in telecom since 1997 um i'm also involved in several different charity projects uh, and the pop-up shop is something that's really close to my heart working with simon's been um been really really beneficial learned a lot and uh, yeah it's, it's great to be able to be to be able to to Give something back to the community where the community really benefits from it. Okay. Simon, your background. Hi, um, I've been in retail for nearly 30 years now. So I started in uh, 1995. Um, I've worked with a number of major retailers, um, including Morrison's and Asda. And now I own my own retail consultancy business and have been working with small, medium enterprises and other suppliers into retailers for the last eight years. Uh, the pop-up shop, as Marshall says, is an annual um, project that we you know, carry out in partnership. And uh, we've got a good uh, complementary set of skills, which seems to make it a success every year. OK, so let's let's go back seven years. OK, so we have this idea. Who's, who's, who was first with the idea? Was it Marshall or Simon? I think it was, I think what happened was Simon and I had known each other for a while and we'd, um, we, we, we just, I can't remember where it actually came from, but we ended up in, in Starbucks, other coffee shops are available, but we ended up in Starbucks and um, we were just sat there and we thought, you know, why did we just do, I think I actually said, why did we just set up a pop-up, um, set up a temporary shop? And I think Simon was a bit taken about thinking, are you serious? Do you think we can actually do this? And Simon said yes, and then we looked at each other and I thought, this is what the community needs. There's a real, the, 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 the importance of Passover without going into becoming religiously um, involved is that, that it, it, it essentially celebrates the escape of, of the Jews from, the perse from persecution in Egypt. And it's a period where there are only certain foods can be eaten. Um, they have to be what we call kosher for Passover, kosher for Pesach. And there, you, in order to have those foods, there has to be someone who can provide them. Um, and like Simon said earlier, there was no one there. There was no, there was no opportunity for people to buy. And it would have meant people trekking over the motorway to Manchester as an, as an alternative, which isn't ideal for a lot of people. So we thought, well, how can we do it so that we can create a solution for the Leeds community? Um, 
And I think the best way of explaining it is that literally within, within a week, we had a location, we had suppliers, we had funding, and we'd set up a business and, and we were ready to go. Day one, we didn't know any of this was going to be achievable. Day four, we were very fortunate, very fortunate that, that a member of the community turned around and said to us, because you have to take into consideration, we were buying food with no credit line. So we weren't going to get credit from any of our suppliers. We were very fortunate that we had a benefactor within the, within the community that said, you guys go and do it. I will make sure that everything is covered for you until you've sold everything and, and your payers back. And I think without that generosity, we'd have struggled. Um, we, I don't think we could have done it. Um, but that, that was where the idea came from. It, it was one of those situations, I think Simon will agree, where people say, yeah, we should do things, we should do something. We did it. We did do it. And I think there was a, a really practical approach that we took. Um, it, it sounds really simple, you know, to just set up a shop, etc. But I think the practical experience that we both have lent itself very well to really establishing a list of what are the things we have to achieve in order to set this project up and what are the outcomes? What do they have to uh, be in order for us to make it successful? but that the community benefit from it as a whole and we did it i was going to say so what was on that list so you've you've had the idea you've got a, you've been very fortunate to get a, a backer just take us through very briefly you know like somebody who's listening and goes oh i want to do a pop-up shop what what were those basic first steps like and how did you solve each one of those three things three really simple things so we said we need the product, we need somewhere to sell it from, and we need the financial backing in order to purchase the product and to pay for the location and all the other um, things we needed like fridges and, and various other uh, 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 accoutrements. But it was only, it was those three things that we focused on three things um, and we just picked them off one by one. We basically, didn't have anywhere for a while. That was one of the last things that we had to uh, to wait to find out. But getting the stock was all about communicating with the suppliers and saying, look, you guys have this stock available. We know that the shop closed and the shop that closed, we're taking it on. So we'll buy the stock. What do we need to do? I think the, the interesting thing is there was no historical data, which is key for any retail operation, for any business operation. It's it's. It's that historical data that allows you to know what to purchase and in what amounts to purchase. Now we were, I guess really, this is Simon's strength where he had the, he'd worked within the environment previously with the deli that closed down. So we had a, a basic understanding, which we, which was pivotal in, in us buying the right amount of stock. Um, because the last thing you want to do is either overstock or understock. But I think in the first year, Simon will correct me, but I think our sell through was about 93%. In year one, bit higher, bit higher. there you go. <laughs> so that was, you know, that that was a, a massive achieve, achievement, really, from a standing start um, to after, after I think we had four weeks or three weeks trading. So what, 97%? Is that what it was? Something like that to sell through was really a hell of an achievement. And it, and, and, and it, yeah, that, that's what made it successful. I think the key as well with a pop-up shop is making sure that you aren't left with anything at the end. That's the risk. Uh, if you're left with something at the end, then that will cost you. And if you have no other way of, of financially moving that product any, anywhere else, then that will hurt you. And that's where the real skill comes. Um, and having very little left made a very, very big difference to us. Okay. So just, just on that first year, obviously you pretty much shooting blind. What were the, what were the major problems or issues? Once you'd got the product, once you got the premises, once you got the backing, during that trading period of two, two and a half weeks, what were the major problems you came across in the first year? The first challenge was actually the day that we opened because we only had, because we based it out of um, one of the synagogues, we only had access to that hall after the Sabbath went out on the Saturday evening and we were opening at 10 o'clock on the Sunday morning. And in addition to that, the weather was absolutely horrendous. It was snowing like you've never seen. And we were in the situation where we've got loads of 
um, hundreds of boxes to unload, fridges to stock, every item needed to be priced. And we managed to get in, I think, about 15 volunteers. We started about nine o'clock in the evening. We worked nonstop till 2, 2.30. Simon and I went home. We were back in at six o'clock the following morning, finished everything off. And at 10 o'clock, we started trading. Mm. Um, so location was the biggest challenge because we only had access very late. The weather <laughs> and also manpower. We, we haven't touched on manpower. You know, at the end of the day, we've got money to buy products. But have we got money to, to, to cover wages? Not really. So we, we worked with a group of volunteers. We were very fortunate also that the fridges in the first year were, were covered by a, an anonymous donation as well. So that really helps because that's about three, three and a half grand. Yeah. And that's, a, again, a massive outlay. And without that, there's no way we could have operated. Okay. So I assume, so we've sold 97% in year one. After that first year, what was, you know, when you, when you finally got to bed and thought, shit, that's all finished. How did you look, how did you, how did you analyze what you'd done and, and, you know, what was your view of that first year? So one of the things that we did right from the very beginning, um, and this is kind of my heartland really, is we recorded every single product that we sold. Um, we, what did we buy? And what did we have left? And therefore, what did we sell? So and also we, when we sold out of correct, that particular product. Correct. So we tracked every little important piece of data to make sure that if we were to do it again, and there was no guarantee that we were going to do it again, we at least had enough information to tell us what we sold, what we missed sales wise, um, and you know what we needed to do in the future from a buying perspective to make it successful again. Um, having that data was absolutely key. Uh, jump forward a year to making better decisions. Um, and, you know, it, I suppose any business likes to have historical information. They like to see the trends and how their business is working over a period of time um, to help them make better decisions. We only had one set of data, um, but it was better than what we had previously, which was absolutely nothing. Okay, so going into year two, and when, don't worry, listeners, we're not going to do every single year one by one. <laughs> <laughs> we going can't in, go through that. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So going into year two, how different was that from, from the first year? Well, from year two to date, we've been doing it conjun in conjunction with um, a local, the, lo the, the local kosher deli in Leeds uh, and kosher butcher. So we've used their credit lines and Simon and I operate a, um, uh, as if it's our own business, we, we do exactly what we what we did in year one, uh, but we have less pressure in one respect because we have the credit lines. The flip side to that is we're answerable also to other people so that there's more pressure. So we need to be absolutely, absolutely 100% accurate in, in the data that we provide, uh, in what we buy and, and, and how we and how we sell it. Um, and I will say it's a learning curve and every single year we learn something different. Um, you you know you, you you think you're doing something right, and then you look back and you think maybe we didn't do that. Maybe that didn't work in the in the way that we intended it to work. And I'll give you a prime example. Um, I think maybe with four days trading last year to to go towards the end of last year's period, we started reducing a lot of products in price, which was great because it was going to help us move product. Until somebody rang up and said, you know, I'm a little bit upset actually. I came in yesterday. I spent a hundred quid on, on X and now that same amount of stock would have only cost me 50 quid. And actually it's a very good point. Mm. So what we learned from that was we open with the offers. We go, we know from day one where the discounts are going to be and that's what we communicate. And actually for the first time this year, we were able to communicate not only price freezes, sorry about the pun, but price reductions as well. And that went down really well because people saw in the prices. One of the things that um, part of um, the Jewish community, people like to have things organized. And when it comes to Passover shopping lists, people have these pieces of parchment that they've had for generations. They've got these recipes of products that you would never even imagine exists or ever existed. And people have this price list and they have this idea of they need product X, Y, and Z. And if they haven't got it, it's panic stage. So what are we gonna do? Who am I gonna call? What am I gonna do next? So people, we, we know the products we have to we have to provide and we, we sort of aim the prices and the reductions at rewarding those products and so that people will come in and, and like most retailers, 
we've got to have a lost leader as well. I think every year, though, it, ev- I was going to say, Phil, every every year, retail is a cycle. Yeah, it's a 52-week calendar. Um, and it, 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 it ebbs and flows and it changes year to year. And there are lots of different factors that can change that. It's even more challenging when you're talking about a very specific seasonal product where you have a limited time frame to clear that product. Yep. Um, the challenge is a fundamentally different one. Um, and the smallest difference can make a much bigger impact on how you go about trying to achieve the same goal that you tried to last year. Um, I reference COVID, for example. Um, that was year oh, four, three, three four. Three, yeah. Anyway, um, COVID was probably the single greatest retail project challenge I've ever faced. Sorry, I was going to I was going to come on to COVID, but just going back to your point there, Simon, about you have a limited time to shift a limited period of stock. I assume this is exactly the same as fireworks, Christmas goods, uh, Easter product, that sort of thing that you would have seen in in call it grown up retail. Would that be the, Would that be true, or is it or is it slightly different? Do you know what? The principles are exactly the same. They're always the same. Effectively, you are selecting a range of products that you know historically have sold over a period of time, and you're trying to maximize the full price sales opportunity for that whilst minimizing the percentage of stock that you have left at the end of it. So, you know, Christmas, the time period to sell product is much longer because it normally Christmas starts on October the 1st and runs through till, you know, um, October uh, to December the 24th. Um, fireworks, which is the shortest seasonal window for sales, happens in three days. Uh, but that's very different because the product is always a sale or return. For this, you're talking about goods that have got a limited shelf life. So food that's in a you know refrigerator will only last a certain amount of time. Even dry goods will last weeks or months only. So, you know, it, it presents a very, very fundamentally different challenge, especially when you're providing a range of products that runs across that whole spectrum and it's all food and it people's taste buds are different, aren't they? Right. Right. And so before we get on to COVID, I want to talk to our listeners about Leeds Business Podcast Fair Deal. The Leeds Business Podcast Fair Deal has two sides to it. My side of the business or my side of the deal is I bring you interesting and fascinating guests like Marsh and Simon, totally free of charge. Um, And your side of the deal, Mr. or Mrs. Listener, is also has two parts. Part number one, I want you to recommend this podcast to one other person. And part number two is I'd like you to post a review or give us a thumbs up on the app that you're listening to this on. Sound like a fair deal, Marshall Simon? Absolutely. Very fair deal. Okay, so COVID. Um, so at this point, let's just let's put this in perspective. So you've been going three years? Was this year four? So it's yes. year three. Yeah. Okay. So year three. Year three, obviously, you've got two years of experience behind you. You're planning on it. I think this went quite well the last two years. We'll do it again. And Take it from there. And everything you've just said was completely and utterly irrelevant. Because overnight, <laughs> we had to change. Literally, overnight, we had to change the, the whole business model. Because we went into lockdown. Um, we had um, a, 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 an event hall full of stock. And we had to convert, as Simon mentioned earlier, from a typical retail operation to a mail order stroke delivery operation. Uh, and we got, we within, I think it was probably five or six trading days, we dispatched over 800 separate orders to people within the community. Um, we had a, a, an amazing support of volunteers. And I think that's what's really worth mentioning is that the community, the reason Simon and I are so committed to the community is because we've got such a great community. And I think the proof of that was when we called out for help during COVID, we were inundated. We, we, we had to turn people away because we couldn't have enough, we couldn't have too many people within the hall because of um, keeping a safe distance from, from people. But we had, we were, we were sending deliveries out left, right and centre. Yes, we made the occasional, occasional mistake. And I remember 
we actually closed, I think it was two o'clock on the, the day before Passover came in or the day of Passover. So essentially from six o'clock in the evening, that's when the festival begins at sundown. And between closing at two o'clock to five o'clock, both Simon and I both went back to the shop on two separate occasions because we'd forgotten people and we couldn't let them have no food for Passover. So literally we sat down about five to six. We, that was when we'd finished. Um, and it was a commitment that we made, but we couldn't have made that commitment and, and, and succeeded without the, strength, the, 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 the help and the support of the community behind us. So just, just for our listeners, just give us a, a timeline because obviously Passover moves year to year. Um, when Boris sat there and said, right, lockdown, how many days before the shop opened was that? Well, it, so, so it, was, it was two days. So I remember sitting in a meeting somewhere else um, in, in the community and the call came through to say, we're going into lockdown from tomorrow. All these buildings need to be shut. And I thought, OK, I need to ring the people who manage this building that we're in to make sure that we can use it. I need to think of how we can take people's orders because nobody had told us what they wanted. They were all going to come in and shop. So we had to find a way of recording all that information. Then we had to record all the stock that we'd received so that someone, which was me, could sit and go through the list of orders versus stock received and then literally ration product to people. So it, it was, it, it was, it was, ho it was horrible. I have to say it was, it was incredibly stressful because, you know, we had a responsibility to the customer to deliver what we, you know, was had promised, uh, albeit in a different way. So we sent out spreadsheets for people to complete. They either, emailed them back to us. And so we had to manually complete a spreadsheet. We had them sent back on Excel form so we could copy and paste. We had to take everybody's details. So we had to create a database. Um, and then we had to then have pick. people to pick the stock. Now there weren't that many people allowed in a confined space at all um, from that point onwards. So for the space of four or five days, I think I remember doing somewhere in the region of about 90,000 steps in a room that was probably about 10 meters by 10 meters, just picking orders, constantly picking orders. Fantastic for the waistline, <laughs> but incredibly exhausting. And, and we also took over a second room within the synagogue where we literally had A to Z in, on A4 stickers and we were placing the each order by surname so that the volunteers could come in, we'd, tell to them, we'd say to them, okay, uh, the Adams family, for want of a better name, uh, they're over there, there's three bags, make sure you take the three bags there, but there's also three bags in the fridge and there's two in the freezer. So we'd have a, a full list and, and, and it would be literally ticked off before every single one went, every single delivery went out. Picking stations and um, warehouse storage sections, basically. Wow. Unbelievable. Wow. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. So, so just to put it into perspective, we usually take in somewhere in the region of about 2000 cartons of product on an annual basis. OK, and that usually amounts to somewhere in the region of around 25,000 units, 25 to 30,000 units of stock. So you know, when you think about the volumes that are, are in play, it, it's quite a quite an operation for an eight, eight, 10 day trading period. Then you have to pick it all. And the, the, the thing is, we'd actually put everything on display as if it was going to be a retail operation. So the hard work we'd done up front by literally taking everything out of the box and pricing it, had we known two, three days earlier, then we'd have saved ourselves half the job because we wouldn't have needed to price every item. And in those days also, we had a, a very old till system where we were literally, literally typing in everything, everything as per value. This year, we, we're working alongside Ringer Till in Leeds, and they've been brilliant. They've been really supportive. They've given us the tills um, free of charge, really, because they they want to support the community and what we're doing. And we've got a, a complete POS system that barcodes everything, gives customers a complete um, printed receipt. But back in COVID, we, it was literally, it was like going to the corner shop in Coronation Street. 
you literally had a piece of paper and everything at a different value. And and bless them, you'd have the elder members of the community coming back in or ringing up saying, can you tell me what this £4.29 is? Now, the problem is we may not have had a, a product at £4.29. We may have had a product that we'd missold or mispriced, so we had to amend it manually. So rather than charging £5 an item, we'd, we'd charge it at £4.29 to compensate for the mistake. But try remember that with 25,000 transactions. Impossible, absolutely impossible. But it was a it, it, it was an experience. We were good. We were good. <laughs> we did all right. We're still here. I know you're live at the moment. So, what do you think the the key learnings are that you're putting in place now for for this year that you've learned over the last seven years? I think, from my perspective, um, the, the, I think it's worth on answering that. There's two very different personalities here. And um, we, we've, I, I'm, I'm very much the old kind of, um, uh, you know, the, the typical salesperson. Let me talk to people, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll push things to them, and I'll sell them things, and I'll make them. We'll, we'll have a, a laugh, and and so on and so forth. But I couldn't do that without the data that's provided, and knowing, you know, the, the data that Simon. He's very analytical, and we actually complement each other in that way. What we have done previously, it's not fair saying that I'm the only salesperson because we've actually sold ourselves by doing videos. We, we did a couple of dance videos which went around the community like hot fire and people asked us to do them again, but we ran out of ideas, thank God. <laughs> one of us has got a musical talent and the other one hasn't. I'll let you work that one out yourselves. But um, we, we got some really good feedback from the community. We tried to involve the community in everything that we did, mm -hmm. especially during COVID, because that was the time where people were, going, where people were scared and we, we allowed them to, to just relax for that little bit, that little five minutes. They knew that they were going to get their products. And when they, and, and if they were on social media, they also had a bit of a laugh when we did um, our little dance video with masks on. Simon, what, what, do, you think, what do you think the big learnings are? Yeah, I, I think it, it's like I'm regurgitating things that have been written in books that successful, you know, business owners and, and, and individuals at work have, have probably realized for themselves before, but it, it, it doesn't happen by itself. And it happens because of the people who have the knowledge and experience and who together can, you know, bring a, a, a team that satisfies all the criteria. Um, and I suppose for me personally, I don't have the answer to every single question. Um, it, it relies upon, you know, finding the right people to work with. I think for Marshall and I, you know, when we sat down in that coffee shop and had the conversation, it, it almost felt quite natural because we both were thinking in the same way, but we weren't thinking of the same thing. Um, and therefore it, we, we complemented each other very well. I think we listened to each other, um, but we're also very kind of able to constructively criticize. And I think that's something that I've learned as well over the last few years that, um, you know, it, it's important to look at what's around you and who's around you and listen to the people who are doing the day-to-day -day jobs that you're not doing because without those people and that experience, it just doesn't work. You've, you've mentioned, I mean, obviously it's your background, you've mentioned data. I mean, how important has it been for the pop-up shop and for those who are listening who are in any type of retail or in type any, anything commercial? You know, data's you know, big data. People talk about data all the time. How important is it and, and how, do, how do our listeners use their data? So, so data for me is the key to success of any organization, business. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a retailer or a service industry. Um, all the answers to success are in front of you if you capture the, the information that you can use to, to help grow your business and also reduce your cost base. Uh, if you, you ignore it at your peril, frankly, um, the, you've heard of the old Pareto rule, the 80-20 rule. Um, in my world, if you get 80% of it right and you get 20% of it wrong, you should just about do all right. You wash your face and make a little bit. But if you can reduce that 20% to 15 or 10% or even 5%, then you are being successful on a regular basis. Um, I, I, I speak to lots of business owners and have worked with some and haven't worked with others who 
who are a little bit afraid of numbers, if I'm honest. Um, they like the piece of paper that gives them the weekly answer and says, oh, this is what we took and this is how much we were up on last year and this is how far ahead or behind budget we are. But it's when you dig into the detail behind that, when you can really understand what makes your business tick. So you can decide what are the things I should carry on doing that are successful? What are the things I should stop doing because they're just not working or they're costing me money? And where are the areas which seem to be trending upwards that I might want to start investing a little bit more time in? Um, and data, it, it gives you all the answers, always. I was uh, a, a, an old boss of mine who I actually didn't like and didn't get on with. But the one thing he taught me, he used to say to me, read the numbers. And he said, what do you mean by read the numbers? And, and when I was running my business, I said that to my team, read the numbers. It's about collecting not only the numbers, the right numbers, reading what the numbers, reading what the numbers are telling you, and then deciding what those numbers are suggesting you should do. And they're the key bits, not just having tons and tons and tons of data. Um, so you've done a pop-up shop for seven years. So let's say somebody who's listening wants to set up their own pop-up shop. Apart from don't do it, what would your, what would your advice be? <laughs> um, I, I'm going to answer this in a, in a, in a, I was always told it was very difficult to go into partnership because, um, I was always told that, you know, do your own thing, be your own boss. There's nothing like it. And when you bring somebody else in, a lot of the time there can be friction because you don't always agree. I would actually say that in, in the experience that I've had with the pop-up shop, that's been a benefit having somebody to bounce ideas off. And, and the, and the reason I'm saying bounce ideas off is because you and I had a chat, not so well, if you quite a few years ago, Phil, about challenges that I had and, 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 and just going back on what Simon said earlier, the, the data was there in front of me. The answer was there in front of me before we even spoke. And, and, and that's always stayed with me. And I think what, I think as far as this is concerned, um, if you're going to do it, go and do it by yourself if you really want to do it. But, but there's a great advantage of working with other people. If you've got somebody else that you can trust, somebody else that trusts you, somebody who's got different skill sets to you. And I think that's really key. I think the different skill sets is an area that people maybe sometimes ignore. Um, get somebody who can complement what you're doing. Um, and, and be willing to listen. I would always say, from my perspective, from my experience, do it with somebody else. Okay, Simon, what would you? What would your advice be to somebody who wants to set up a pop-up shop? Have a plan. Have a really simple plan. Um, don't overcomplicate things. Just think about fundamentally what are the key elements uh, that you need in order to set up a pop-up shop. You know, what are the financial requirements? Uh, the logistical requirements, staffing. I suppose it's like it's like it's like setting up a, start, a shop from the start that's going to continue running and running. But actually, you know that there is an end point. So understand what the challenges are of getting to that end point. You know, it takes some people years and years to to be able to sell a business um, and exit it properly. But this is about a short window of opportunity. So. Make sure you're really, really clear about your objectives um, and, and, and follow through on that. The thing I would add to that is we were, we were very fortunate because we had our target market. We knew the product that we needed to sell. And I would say it's absolutely essential that you know your target market and you know that you can satisfy that market with the, with the product that you're going to, or the solution that you're going to provide. I think that's absolutely key. We were lucky, as I say, because we, we, we had a, a specific product selection that we had to sell. We knew when we had to sell it and we, know, we knew to whom we had to sell it. If you're going to a more generic pop-up, those are the key drivers as well. Right. Okay. Good stuff. Great advice. Great advice. Now, every week on the Leeds Business Podcast, we ask our guests to give us a how-to. So um, I think, Marshall, you're taking this one. So what's your how-to? And... Tell us how to do it. I think um, being in telecoms is very similar to a lot of other service industries. And we've all been in a situation where we've been sold to, when we've been promised the earth, when we've been sold a product or a vehicle or a, uh, a sofa or whatever it may be. And, I, and I'm a, a great believer that if you're a salesperson, you can sell anything. 
I think it, it's, it, you know, if you've got it built in, you can go out there, you can sell anything at all. What we do, um, we I've always called the, the period of a contract, of a contract, the lockout period. So, for example, if we sign a client up to a mobile contract to two years, that 24 month period is the lockout. And it's during that period that we as a business have to have to succeed in providing what we said we were going to provide at point of presentation because anybody can sell and promise the earth. But the value of you actually providing that service during the contractual period ensures that you're going to be invited back to the table at point of renewal. And in our industry, and very, and, and very similarly to other service industries, it's not the initial contract where the value is. It's the renewal, because that shows that you can actually deliver. That shows how you're measured, because ultimately we're talking about high retention levels. And you're not going to achieve those retention levels unless you provide the services that you're going to provide. And I can think of numerous companies within specifically telecoms that pro promise the earth and never deliver. Never, ever deliver. And I'm, you know, if I'm up against one of these, these, these businesses in a, in a proposal, I would never dish the dirt and I would never insult my, my competition. But I know in the back of my mind that these guys are not going to provide the service that they've said that they're going to provide. And ultimately, their measurement of success is different to mine. We are measured on our retention. Our retention runs at in excess of 98, 99%. And that's been consistent. That's been consistent because of what we do during that lockout period. And I think that's key to any business. You've got a business on board. You've got a client, sorry, you've got a client on board. You're, you've got a period where you are going to provide that service. If it's printers, if it's food services, if it's law services, do what you said you are going to do. Don't make promises you can't, you can't fulfill and be honest and upfront. And if you can't do something, tell people, you know what, this is actually something that I can't achieve. However, what if I could offer this to you and, and manage expectations? So for me, it's a case of, of lock out, do what you're going to do, manage expectations and make sure that you're invited back to that table at point of renewal. That's a really simple lesson that actually your retention policy is based on your delivery. Absolutely. You don't deliver you don't fulfill your promises, you will not be invited back. And I, you know, I've got, I've been in the telecoms industry since 19, since 1997. I've had my own business since 2003. And it's not rocket science, Phil. This is what frustrates me. It's not rocket science. Put yourself in the shoes of the buyer. Yeah. How frustrated are we when we as buyers are promised things that never occur? Absolutely. So why would it be any different for you or your customers? And it's no different in retail. It's no different in the pop-up shop. Um, our customer buys our product. So if we don't fulfill that pledge to that customer and give them the great experience of shopping with us, then they won't come back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, brilliant, brilliant uh, lesson there for pretty much everybody in business. Um, so one final question. Um, What's going to be different next year, or is it just more of the same? Or do we wait to see what the lessons are from this year before we put them in place for next year? I will answer the first part because I know Simon will want to answer that as well. But for me, it, it's taking away the data that we're collating now. So it's when have we sold out of what products, what products have been received well. Um, we, we have a lot of competition across the Pennines, as I mentioned, and um, we, we've had some really positive feedback. We've had people come in and have said, you know, I've, I've been to, to such and such in Manchester. I've been to such and such in London. And you're actually a lot cheaper and your choice of products is great. So we know we're improving there. We're on an upward curve. And as far as that's concerned, we have to continue to do that. We've, in, we've installed a, a, a fully state-of-the-art POS system, as, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we've learned about product location within the shop at, with the shopping area, how people like it. People love to come in and say, oh, it's great, there's so much space and um, the pricing is really important. So I think for me, it's what we do good, doing better, and what we've done poor, making sure we don't do that again. Yeah, all of that. And, and I think as you get more and more data and as you become more and more familiar with, with um, the information year on year, you can dig deeper into it. Um, and, and start to really hone the environment 
whether that's the space and how you use it, or whether that's the, the volumes and quantities that you're buying, um, you know, we can really understand not just at an individual product level, but as a category, how is a particular area performing? Have we sold more this year than last time? If we have, is that because we bought more or is that because we have customers that seem to purchase a new product that we brought in? So it's really digging into the detail a little bit more. Brilliant. And it's knowing your customer. It's remembering the, the type of customer we have, that the, the customer, the age group, the age difference between our customer base can be, you know, we've got some 80, 90 year old customers who is the, it's, they are so happy to come in to see us and they have a, you know, they have a laugh, they come in, they've got the chair, they'll sit down and, and then they'll continue the shopping. Then we've got the younger generation. Oh, my grandma used to buy this. And how do you make this? And, and, and she used to do this and, and we, we engage with them. And, um, we, we, we try, we try and make it a, a good experience and we try, we want people to come back and, and, and it's the old adage that you'll acknowledge as much as anybody, people buy from people. So it's great having the product, it's great having the location, but if you haven't got the, the ability to intera interact with your client base, you might as well finish it. It does make a difference because price is usually the single biggest driver for customer decisions when purchasing product. Um, if you can take that element and make it a, a less of a consideration, then you will retain your customers better and sell more product. Brilliant. Marsh and Simon, it's been absolutely fascinating, but it's, it's the interesting bit is it's, it really is a simple microcosm of basic retail. And for those lessons, thank you very much indeed. Thank Thanks, you. Phil. Cheers, Phil. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found it interesting, inspiring and of use. To make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes, please subscribe to the show. Go on, do it now. Do it now before you go off and do something else. Thank you. Much appreciated. Oh, and don't forget our fair deal. See you next week.